Depression is a severe illness. Most people do not realize that. They see depression as a mood, as a kind of disappointment, as a state that people can get over if they simply take themselves in hand, go on a vacation or do something that will improve their mood. People who are suffering from clinical depression, that is not the case. Virtually nothing can make them feel better. Clinical depression is different from sadness. Sadness is something that we all experience. It's an emotion um, that's very common. The difference between sadness and clinical depression is that clinical depression impacts on functioning. So things like depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure, lack of appetite or increased appetite, insomnia or hypersomnia, psychomotor agitation or restlessness, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, difficulty concentrating or making decisions, and finally thoughts of death, suicide or a plan to commit suicide are all typical symptoms of clinical depression. If depression is a biological illness, what is the biology of the illness? What exactly is wrong with the brain in people who are suffering from depression? There is really no definitive answer, but there are some very important clues that we do have. In depression, we know that medications that make serotonin the neurotransmitter serotonin more available in the brain are effective in treating depression. We know that medications that make noradrenaline, another neurotransmitter, more available in the brain are also effective. So clearly problems in the availability of these neurotransmitters at critical points in the brain where neurons communicate with other neurons is a very important factor. Another uh, system that we've been studying for many years in the field is the cortisol stress response system in the brain. The hypothalamus, a part of the brain that is very old, that controls the pituitary gland and makes it secrete a hormone that stimulates the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol, the stress hormone. It's possible that a short burst of a stress hormone, which leads to a person to perform better and overcome his difficulty, is a positive, healthy, productive thing, but that chronic increases in cortisol, uh, a chronic anxiety, can predispose to depression by causing secondary changes uh, in the brain. There are very many different classes of antidepressants available. The most frequently used are specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or the so-called SSRIs. These are the first-line treatments for depression when medication is employed, and they are effective in about 20 to 30 percent of cases. When SSRIs do not work, then so-called augmenting medications are used, these are medications which are added to the SSRIs in order to increase their effectiveness, or a switch is made from SSRIs to an antidepressant of a different class. With the use of serial treatment, 60, perhaps 70 percent of people with depression can achieve remission. The question is, what about the remaining people? What about the remaining 30 percent or so? The answer is that there are a lot of people whose depression is not successfully treated. They can have some improvement in symptoms, things do get better for a while before getting worse again, and ultimately they do develop what is called chronic depression. And this is perhaps one of the most major, one of the most significant challenges facing psychopharmacologists today. We are now strongly entering a phase where we see the limits of the medications, where we have come to some blind ends and where the newer medications are not always any more effective than the older ones. I think today even biological researchers of depression like myself are convinced that psychological treatments are effective uh, in depression and clearly both uh, chemistry and psychology play important roles in depression and its treatment. And what we know about depression is that not only is there a biological influence, which is generally why people use medication 
to treat depression, but there's also an influence of the way we think. So the idea in cognitive behavior therapy is that um, people start having some negative thoughts, we call them negative automatic thoughts. If somebody um, was criticized quite often by their parents or by their teachers, then they have a schema that they're not good enough. If they're going along in their life and everything is good, then they feel okay. But if they fail the exam and the schema that I'm not good enough gets activated, then they'll start thinking negatively. Like, I'll never be good enough, I'll never pass an exam again. What we want to do is help them see that these thoughts might be what we call distorted or erroneous. In the treatment, patients are asked to identify their negative automatic thoughts. In other words, what was the thought that was going through your head when you were feeling bad. Then we teach them how to challenge these thoughts. We use a technique called Socratic questioning. Do I know for certain that this is true? How would somebody else think about the same situation? These kinds of questions to help them challenge their negative thoughts and come up with what we call alternative thoughts or rational responses. It's really important to understand that treatment is not necessarily only biological. It's not simply like, oh, I have a headache, I'm going to take an aspirin and then I'm going to feel better. You might feel better, but we would want to also understand what the causes of the headaches are. So if we can change that negative thinking, then we can prevent all future headaches or all future depressive episodes because they learn how to manage their um, negative thoughts, which will prevent them from having depression in the future. The fact that serotonin reuptake inhibitors are not effective in all cases led to a new focus on the development of drugs that act on more than one system. And in fact, several of these are already available. The wave of the future is the development of drugs that act not only on the serotonin and noradrenaline system, but also on the dopamine system, the so-called multifunctional drugs. Now there's also a newer form of therapy called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is the idea that thoughts just go through your head, because we all have thoughts that go through our heads, and we just watch them go through our heads. We put them like a cloud, like the thought onto a cloud and we let it go across the sky as opposed to starting to interpret it or misinterpret it or make a big deal out of it. And the research has shown that people who learn mindfulness-based cognitive therapy after they've been depressed once have a much less likelihood to relapse. I think in many cases of moderate depression, psychological treatments are as effective as medication treatments so it might be important to emphasize that patients who are verbal who like to talk about their problems who are motivated to talk about their problems should be given a chance to treat their depression with cognitive behavior therapy patients who are unable to talk about their problems or too depressed to talk about their problems should be given a realistic, optimistic, truthfully optimistic evaluation of why they should take their medication so that they have a much better chance of being well and able to work and enjoy life in the future.